This is a newsletter on Substack written by Sean Reynaldo. I found him on in Twitter actually, and he kind of speaks a little bit about um, the future of dance music, what's going to go on post COVID 19, right? Trying to kind of guess and estimate as to what um, the climate or the landscape will be like, which is quite fun, isn't it? We don't necessarily know what's happening. Things are changing day by day, but we can kind of. Um, speculate and have a bit of fun with what's actually going on so this is a really good newsletter that he kind of puts out i'm assuming bi-weekly i'm not sure how how often he writes them but it's on substack it's um all one word first floor dot substack dot com you can kind of um include your email address on there and you will get those sent directly to your inbox this is number 32 first floor and it says techno in their alternate timeline um it's a the, the, the so uh oh, it's a weekly uh newsletter as well so i'm sure right now though the weekly uh first was a weekly electronic music digest that includes news and my favorite new tracks cool anyway so this is a how it starts off it says on my mind a few weeks ago i was asked to write something about what electronic music will look like after covid19 pandemic is over although it sounded like an interesting sort of thought experiment i ultimately wound up passing on the assignment partly because i haven't been feeling terribly inspired to write um while the world is tittering on the edge of collapse, but mainly because I was hesitant to write something that would essentially be a totally speculative piece, which I enjoy doing myself. For what it's worth, um, I'd love to read this article, assuming that someone li less literal than me was willing to take it on the chin, or to take it on, sorry. At this point, we really have no idea what the world is, let alone the electronic music landscape is going to look like when the pandemic is over. Right now, much of the industry seems to be hoping that things will go back to normal within a few months. But the longer this um, crisis drags on, the more that seems like wishful thinking. There are just so many unanswered questions. When will clubs open? Which will which will even be financially be able to open? Um, when will people have the money to go out and party? And if so, will it be safe for them to cram into confined spaces and dance a night away? Will international travel DJs be afforded, affordable or even possible? Will promoters be able to pay anything approaching to the fees that they were paying before? And where all festivals fit into the picture and how the hell are people going to be able to afford tickets to keep them available so this is all really good question so let's go, go through them one by one right um because i think this is quite a good way of posing it so when will clubs reopen i think that's again something that someone like Adina white isn't abiding by but i guess the common the easy answer for that one is that it'll reopen whenever the government says we can reopen right whenever it's safe to reopen most businesses will reopen because even though clubs probably are way down the list of kind of requ way down the list in terms of uh required to open right um we can probably get by with not having a club open again for maybe the end until the end of summer no one really needs it. it's not like you know it's not an essential service in that respect but it will have a trickling down effect if one business opens the clubs and then justifiably justifiably plead their case to their local councillor uh, mayor member of parliament whatever it may be right so whenever they decide to put the green light and say hey you guys can go again we'll go again so that would be happening so that's not really something to worry about i don't think for the most part what is most part what is mostly what people should be worried about the most when it comes to electronic music is like you mentioned before or in this article is the mindset that people will be in like what damage or what kind of changes in consciousness and habits and kind of just the outlook are people going to have once they step back into the you know quote unquote civilian population are people still going to be the same we don't know um is it gonna are they gonna demand different things we don't know so is that is what that's what people should worry about not when they're open open when they're safe so the second question which clubs will be financially able to open again of course unfortunately for us um the ones that are especially of us that like underground music the ones the clubs that have the most financial backing will stay alive longer right the clubs that have backers who have vested interest in other parts of the nightlife industry will essentially make sure that those places are still able to function once the lights are on because i'm sure some of these people if whether they're investment um uh whether they're hedge fund people whether they're investment bankers whether they're just you know people that have dough they'll they're probably of the mindset that once everything is back to normal there's going to be a fervent desire for people to just burst out this burst out of their front door and run to the nearest place that sells alcohol and get crazy right so they're probably thinking hey if we weather this storm we're gonna see the returns tenfold 
um, once everything reopens again. People are going to go crazy. They're going to be spending like mad. They're going to buy it. They're going to book a table. They're going to uh, book a booth. They're going to order everything off the menu. They're going to tip really well. They're going to bring all their friends and family. Everyone's going to put something in the cloakroom. They're anticipating that kind of level of interest. So that's one thing. On the other side of thing, I guess the mid to low level clubs, the ones that are like, let's say, 800 people downwards or maybe let's say 500 people uh, capacity down are ones that are going to suffer the most because they they were kind of doing they had their foot in the commercial world and also in the underground world they were booking people just from the strength of their recommendations of friends or like contacts and they were also going for the bait so sort of like ra featured people or people that are on the top 20 list of djs around the world so they were wasting some money on the DJs that are booking the big ones because sometimes the fee far exceeds what they probably make in a night especially when it comes to the operational cost and then on the other side of the road as well they were putting themselves in trouble by not um by booking underground DJs who didn't have a didn't have a pool who didn't really have a bit of an audience who were putting on events and no one was turning up there and then you're losing money on that side so those places will suffer um a lot so i don't be surprised if you see a real um, mismatch of places still open right there'll be a really weird cluster of places open and not open don't be surprised to see that also don't be surprised if none of them underground none of the mid-level to low-level places are open at all don't be surprised if only the big dogs the fabrics the print works i don't know all these other weird places are open as opposed to any others don't be surprised that could also be a thing so get have your mind ready for that one but I think the programming is what's going to actually change mostly, I think, going forward, just through just pure necessity, not through um, people being um, about the culture and all that sort of shit. No, that won't be the thing. So it continues here. Um, will people have the money to go out and party? That we're not too sure about. It depends on what it depends on how you view it. If you if you it depends on how you interpret the people no, you don't view, yeah, it depends on who's actually going to these events if the people going to the events are mostly people that work in the service industry you know it's a wrap but i'd assume most of the people that go to these especially some of the kind of deep house tech house sort of events they're mostly people that work in offices right mid-level execs who are probably in a position where they can work from home so they're getting paid or they're on furlough so they're getting paid even for not working or they get maybe done then they get a little package a little severance package so they get some money to tie them down and they are you know going out is intrinsically part of their identity it's part of what they do right they go out on a thursday on a friday go to a festival that's what they do they like to spend any extra money they have on experiential events with their friends and family so that should be fine but if your customers are mostly service people service industry people who work in like you know entry level positions and downwards who earn maybe let's say between let's say under twenty three thousand pound a year they, those people probably won't be able to come to your events so again it's up to how they promote it are these events going to be free um are they going to be donations are they going to be all ticketed are they going to book big deep those are the things that are important but it depends on your audiences if your audience is tech house deep house people who that's where sunglasses in the rave they're going to be fine they've got office jobs they work with, they work some receptionists estate agents chartered accountants all the people they'll be fine the rest of them is going to be a bit shaky um and it says here and if so will it be safe for them to be crammed into a confined spaces and dance from that away probably not and that's why again i'm pretty sure that we're going to see an abundance of especially the weather keeps if especially the weather keeps the you know at this state nice and sunny not too you know not too uh not too hot nice cool breeze don't be surprised if we see the advent or the regeneration of loads of those kind of forest raves that i went to a couple of years ago in hackney and all those kind of places and once a park there'll be an abundance of forest raves probably done a little bit more probably with a bit more polish them not as kind of you know brick and brack and DIY as the other ones i went to because you know they, they attract a certain audience again i'm for it i love it but your regular general average joe isn't probably willing to wade through shit and jump over a hill to go to a forest rave they want something that's a little bit more easy right that just peels off the kind of beaten track but you can kind of get to easily there's a couple shops near it all that sort of shit so it's sort of like a kind of a fake outdoor rave right that's sponsored by a big company so don't be surprised to see those don't be surprised to see loads of open air events in general around town don't be surprised to see loads of kind of um what's that thing they do in in the star before they have like that kind of like little carnival -y thing on the side of the road outside don't be surprised to see loads of free parties so those will be okay no sorry the outside things will be fine because there'll be loads of room and also be 
I think a really big spike in the warehouse party. So you see a lot of people putting on events in unconventional spaces. So obviously it's still buildings, don't get me wrong, but they're not like quote unquote built to house a club of night. They're just in a you know, a photo studio or something. So that'll be a big thing happening, I reckon, going forward. Because people will be a bit more worried about, you know, the space they're keeping. So which will again help it which will then put in favour the big venues like the E one, all these kind of places, they'll be fine for that because, you know, they've got, you know, acres and acres of room. And then another question here will be, will, will international DJs travel? Will international travel for DJs be affordable or even possible? Probably not. And I think it's a good thing. I think far too, I, I've, I've railed against it again. Selfishly, from my point of view, being an up-and-coming or being an inspiring DJ in my side of things, I would much prefer it if we had a club culture that kind of encouraged resonance, right? Encouraged longer sets from local DJs or local artists, encouraged cultivating uh an army or like a collective or like a crew of really talented people that you can kind of rotate week in week out and then you can kind of build their name up and allow them to kind of you know um, put, um spread the sound of your city into different places around the world and then you can kind of supplement and you can kind of add to that by bringing in some big acts to kind of you know be the cherry on top of the cake but not to hold up the entire night i don't think that's really cool so now you're with you're in this weird position where there's really loads of really cool there's also really good people who are on the low level who don't have any they don't play most they don't play out that often maybe once and like maybe twice every three months or whatever maybe which is obviously not enough to get really good at it but then they they're good enough to play out but they don't play often and then the people that are playing often are the ones that are charging the most which doesn't help the places that they're playing in so just for pure necessity and because they just they don't have the money don't be surprised to see a big uh, shift in promoters like you know really kind of beating a dead horse about oh we're, we're promoting this local person she lives around the corner they're only two miles away from the location of the site one of our close friends <laughs> don't be surprised to see all that kind of faux camaraderie around cultivating underground artists which again i'm for i don't care if it's faux or not i just want it to be seen but that will happen for a while until the scene gets back on its feet don't you want you know the bigger acts again it depends on how they work their contract they might be in a situation where the agent put a stipulation in there you know this is an act of god there's no way they can cancel an event that person still has to get booked for another one it kind of they've kind of owed it but don't be surprised to see the first few ones to be mostly um for the people you don't know loads of label friends loads of friends of the promoters the promoters themselves you know blah blah blah, blah. they're calling favors to get that done because they just want to have it open and again i think for the public it should be fine i don't think you've noticed that much of a difference if you have somebody local playing or somebody that's part of the team of the people that are pointed together um, they're probably still of a good standard regardless anyway uh, and then the question here will promoters be able to pay anything approaching the fees they were paying before definitely not and again i think it's a good thing i think we got far too often especially when you look at some of this especially on friday i think saturday sunday is different i think saturday sunday usually is the maybe especially even during the week monday to thursday too is probably the times when the actual experience ravers go out and when you look on ra you see a list of kind of events and you see all the usual big names and stuff but usually on Saturdays it changed so I think that was getting a little bit too you know commonplace um there was a lack of kind of experimentation lack of taking risks everything was too yeah everything was too safe everything was too vanilla um and again those events probably suffered right booking the same person again and again to play somewhere not changing anything up um going through the tried and trusted method of kind of drumming up fake kind of hype about something no one cares about that would inevitably catch up on you and I think it did with um with the dj culture so i think for the most part the paying the obscene prices in paying won't go up and also you have to assume a lot of the bigger acts anyway are gonna be desperate just to play regardless right they're gonna um, they're gonna be uh desperate for some stage time so they don't be surprised to see a lot it'll be, it'll be twofold there'll be a lot of underground people playing and they also might be an abundance of the overground people playing the commercial guys because they might lower their fees just so they can get the sets and reps in playing in front of an audience so that'll be a weird thing to see happening um and then it says here um well festivals fit into this picture and how the hell are people going to be able to afford them uh tickets um so this one's a weird one because i don't um be able to afford ticket the tickets to keep them alive this one i think is weird because i think personally because I, I, I think a lot of people are a bit negative on festivals but i think by and large most people tended to choose going to a festival as opposed to going to a club night in a rate in, in well, a club night in a nightclub somewhere because they got more bang for their buck right and obviously it was a little bit more of a 
buffet way of kind of enjoying electronic music as opposed to specifically going to a club night and not like because a lot of people when they go out i think for the most part there is probably 20 percent of people when they go out don't necessarily know no know where they're going and they specifically don't take somebody i think the wide majority of people go to a location that they don't that they probably don't live far from or that's got easy good transport and then they try and find somewhere that kind of fits what they like and they hope for the best that's it as long as the price ticket the entry price isn't that high they're going to give it a go and then there's there's a small sliver of geeks and dum-dums like myself who you know are obsessed about looking at the lineup and seeing who's playing and what time they're going to appear on blah 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 we're the ones that go specifically for nights but the ones that keep those places alive are the 80 percent right they're the ones that pay the bills they keep the lights on so I think that whole crew kind of saw festivals as a great way to kind of circumvent all that. Um, you can just go to Love Box, you can just go to Field Day, go to Junction, and essentially you're kind of covered as long as you like most of that music, what that's coming, that point in the direction, you'll be fine. You're not going to necessarily have a bad um, experience there. So I think people will make the necessary sacrifices needed to pay for festivals. And I think if you look at it, like, you know, Junction being a good example. The Friday ticket at Junction is like 60 to 80 pounds. They have, uh, let's say, anywhere between 12 to 24 DJs playing on one day, right? That's already way much, way better value for money than it is going to like a Corsica Studios, right? Paying 20 quid to get in, then paying for drinks, then putting your Coke room in, then paying for more drinks. Da, 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 da. By the time you've left the place, you've already probably spent 100 pounds, right? And you're only going to a place for four hours. Where <laughs> Well, the junction is usually the whole day, right? You get there from the afternoon, you leave sometime late in the evening. So you get a lot more bang for your buck. So I think people will make the sacrifice needed to go to those kind of events. So it's going to be a really difficult place to navigate, of course, if you're an operator, if you've got a club, if you're intrinsically a part of making those things happen, putting the deals together, maintenance team. It's going to be difficult to navigate, but I think in large, I think it will be a good thing for this culture. I think we needed a reset. Things were going a little bit too much in the commercial side of things especially the places that were they're quite underground but they were booking loads of really big names to play there it was really strange i never really understood that um so hopefully we'll see a return to a more local community driven side of things i think that's where we really thrive in london personally i think so i think we really thrive because we have everyone knows somebody that can dj everyone knows someone that can dj really well um when they are playing they're really into their stuff um um yeah and i think we we just probably have the best kind of variety of them out so i think there's no excuse for you know for continually booking the top 20 people at ra to play at your place having them you know charge you an exorbitant rate because they don't know you from adam or eve having them turn up and they're not getting a return on your money just because you went to have the flyer say xyz it's just not a smart way to go about things that, that's be another way to kind of maneuver so that will be interesting to see and again we might see the abundance of new pop-up clubs as well happening that might be cool remember the few years ago there's a few of those happening all over the place they had like little temporary licenses that they kind of you know set up shopping and did events in um so especially before the end of the year we had loads of stories appearing on press publications on publications in general saying oh look the event of the rise of warehouse right all these kids are doing all these crazy cool events don't think those are going to stop, right? They'll get even more prevalent, especially when people don't have any money. The first place they're going to go to is the place where you can kind of BYOB, right? Or make a donation at the door. Um, those will be the places that will get most of the love and then it will kind of, you know, go to all the other zones. But I think that's what's going to happen. That's the future I predict in the electronic music space.